Yesterday, I did a post with 10 health markers that you need to know for better health. And whenever I do a post like that, I always like to follow up with a podcast explaining my thought process and what each one really does and why it's important. Because inevitably, people are going to put comments saying, how could you leave out this this marker, this important hemoglobin. You didn't say hemoglobin. What's wrong with you? I'm like, yeah, I didn't put hemoglobin. I put ferritin. If that's any consolation, if you know, you know, if you know, you know. Well, let's go through them. I have it here. It's the same page as yesterday. I was walking around the clinic with the Konisberg test. I've been doing the Konisberg test since I started practicing way 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 back and it is a urine test which is measuring chloride output so what does that have to do with anything it has to do with aldosterone and the amount of aldosterone being produced and quiet the interruptions the aldosterone is a indicator for cortisol just muting this puppy shush so when people come in, I'll get to these do a sample, and I take some of the urine, I add a couple chemicals, and I'm looking for there to be color change. It's supposed to turn red. Turning red is a good thing. If it doesn't turn red, it means that there's not enough chloride in there, which means that you're not producing enough cortisol. It means you're in exhaustion. Being in exhaustion means that your adrenal gland is falling, has significantly fallen behind its production of stress hormones, so it can't keep up. And that's usually when people first come in. It's the indicator that your force field, your buffer, has diminished to the point that symptoms are now creeping in. And in those cases, I give people an adaptogen or a tonic or something to help with adrenal gland function. And when they start taking it, after a few weeks, what they notice is that they have more energy. And some other symptoms just disappear which is an indication that your stress response can buffer or reduce the experience of symptoms and that's why often i point to it as the number one test that you can do to you know see where you are with your overall health because your stress response can really really make or break Symptoms, recurrence of symptoms, development of new symptoms, stamina, energy, immunity, everything, mental stress, emotional stress, sleep. So that is a number that is very useful for me to help my patients. Number two is ESR. Now, ESR is the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and it has to do with inflammation and specifically inflammation in your blood. And it actually is an idea of like, think of it like stickiness. The more sticky your blood is, the more inflammation you have. Literally, the test is simple. I mean, we used to just send people out to the lab and it would be part of our routine blood work. But we can even do it in office now. I remember the first time I actually was still in clinic, we used to do um, like an in-office lab test where you take a finger prick, and there's a, almost like a long thermometer, like a capillary tube. And you have to measure how far the blood tra traverses over a period of time. And essentially, it's telling us how thick or viscous your blood is. And we can do this in the office now, really simple. It's just like, a, it's called the core one. Finger prick, capillary tube, goes into the unit in 30, sec uh, 30 minutes. Ah, one day will be 30 seconds. 30 minutes, we get the, um, the score of your ESR. Now, it's a good indicator for general inflammation, cardiovascular health risks, and it is a nice way to track progress over time because a lot of time people coming in, they have general inflammation. They're not even sure where it came from. Usually your gut, remember, almost all inflammation starts in the gut. I always see that in my live blood analysis. But anyways, and we can track over time how your inflammation is reducing, which is a good thing. It means that the diet's working, 
supplements are working, everything is going in the right direction. The next thing I think that is important to know is your percent body fat. Body fat is a good number to use. I think it's better than using your BMI because nowadays everyone's obese based on the BMI. It's a 200 year old test was 200 years ago. We would be all fatties walking around. They'd be like, what's with this guy? What's he eating? (laughs) How is he getting food? And the truth is we have a lot more food available to us and a lot more environmental toxins too. And people just are bigger. So instead of BMI, I like percent body fat. And it's a nice way to track how you're doing over time. And we use uh, the in-body machine. It's a bioimpedance analysis, and we can do it in-house. It takes a minute to get the results, but you get body fat, BMI, metabolic rate, skeletal muscle mass, uh, extracellular water, compartmentalization, and distribution of fat and muscle. But the body fat, I think, is a good number just to, if you had to take one from there, just to know where your overall health is in terms of metabolism. Because if your body fat's creeping up, you're not eating enough, not eating enough, or eating too many carbs, or inappropriate fasting. We can go into that. I feel like that's another podcast. Number four is the HbA1c. It's glycosylated hemoglobin. And it tells us how well you're regulating your blood sugar over a three-month period. So it's a... Another parameter for diabetes or dysglycemia. And if you are cheating with your diet, having a high-carb diet, low-protein intake, not able to absorb protein, um, skipping meals, snacking, um, late-night eating, these are things that will cause the HbA1c to increase and increase your risk of diabetes. Number five is your thyroid-stimulating hormone. This one is critical for overall metabolic function. And I always say that the thyroid is your backup energy power plant behind the adrenal gland. Now the adrenal gland, I feel like, is the key, and we measure it with the Konisberg. But when the thyroid steps in to compensate for an exhausted adrenal gland, it's not as strong, and people run into often a hyper state initially, hyperthyroid so their tsh number goes really low close to zero and they feel weight loss and nervous and agitation and low appetite and then often this is caused by some kind of exhaustion coupled with a sometimes an autoimmune state and then the flip happens and that tsh skyrockets 20 25 30 i've seen it go that high and then they can't lose weight they feel tired all the time They feel sluggish. They don't know. They can't pick themselves off the bed. And it's because their thyroid has kind of given up completely. It can no longer function. And then they have to be on medication for life to compensate for that, if not caught early. So the hope is that with the TSH, you can see changes, either hyper or hypo, and respond quickly enough that you can stabilize it and maybe address some of the autoimmune state that's aggravating the thyroid and help compensate the adrenal gland so the thyroid's not working on its own. Number six is ferritin. I like ferritin because it's a good indicator for anemias and nutrition. But often it can be, usually those are cases where it's low. But for some, many men, and sometimes menopausal females, it can be overly or high iron which is a risk for organ damage. And often the, the, the uh, I guess, the cure or the response to that is to give your blood, to donate blood, because that'll drop your blood volume and also the iron and the ferritin will follow because blood loss lowers ferritin. Um, but when it's low, generally, we do have to supplement with an iron, iron bisglycinate, for example, or address... If you're having heavy bleeding, then we need to make sure that the stabilizing the the blood loss. Number seven is vitamin D. And it's plenty has been made about the benefits of having good vitamin D levels for immunity and actually its anti-cancer effect. And we know that 
sunlight, sun exposure is critical for maintaining your vitamin D levels. And often people will supplement, but they might not supplement regularly, or they might supplement just during the winter months. And if they find that they're having frequent infections or feeling run down, topping up your vitamin D and making sure that it's at a sufficient level will be important to maintain your general immunity and health. Following vitamin D at eight is B12. Vitamin B12 has so many benefits, but is often underabsorbed in individuals with low stomach acid at the time of the meal. A lot of people, they'll complain that they have high acid. And high acid usually following a meal means that you had insufficient acid before the meal when you need it. And B12 and iron are specifically absorbed in the stomach. So you want to make sure that you're absorbing sufficient amounts so that you're not becoming anemic, tired, forgetful, nerve irritation. When you wake, one of the things that you could um, identify if you're low B12 is first thing, first thing in the morning when you step out of bed, if your feet hurt, it takes you a little while to walk it off, you might have low B12. Number nine is your resting heart rate. In school, we were taught, school, I'm meaning like grade school, I mean, we we're taught 60 to 90 beats per minute is normal. Eh, maybe for a kid, 90 is normal, but when you reach adulthood, Closer to 60s, a little bit healthier. Um, and it can fluctuate depending on how much exercise, cardiovascular exercise you do. And there's something to be said about heart rate variability. When there is an increased variability, that means that your body has a better ability to cope with stress. Uh, and then again, tying into adrenal function. So that's something that, that's good to you know monitor and a lot of our you know, those iWatches or whichever watch you've got, Apple Watch or the Samsungs, they are great at tracking that information. And number 10 is blood pressure. We often kind of overlook and just assume it's normal when we're young, but blood pressure is not always an issue for the elderly exclusively, but can be a sign of stress response in younger people, um, whether some people are anemic or taking low protein, their blood pressure can be chronically low. And uh, these are people that like their veins are very thin. And when they give blood, it's very difficult to isolate a vein that they faint under like, you know, stress. They feel lightheaded walking upstairs. Um, and then conversely, people who are very emotional, very irate all the time, they tend to have high blood pressure. Uh, and that chronically is obviously not very good for your heart. So if you have chronically high blood pressure, but you're young, maybe too young to be medicated in theory, um, cut your salt intake or monitor. Well, I'm going to get attacked if I say that. Be cautious with the type of salt that you're intaking. I should say that. Because it can be an electrolyte imbalance. You can actually have water compartmentalization shifting out of the cells uh, you can also have um, issues with oncotic pressure, which is how your protein is being absorbed into your bloodstream. So some people have central blood pressure issues, but they have peripheral, very weak blood pressure. So in other words, if you increase your ability to absorb protein, usually with betaine at a meal, you can get better systemic peripheral vascular pressure, which means that the blood volume can stretch to all the extremities and is not isolated just to the, the core where it can have high pressure because it's just recirculating and it doesn't get into the outer areas because there's not enough volume. Uh, something to think about there. Honorable mention was made for anti-mullerian hormone for females. Um, I like using this test when there's when a young girl's coming in and she's having issues with regularity of her periods. We're suspecting PCOS, um, and even in cases where there's some, you know, they're having a difficulty conceiving. Uh, it's a very good number, and it speaks to the quality of the eggs and um, the the likelihood of successful conception. And it is a number that can be influenced and changed uh, and enhanced under the right conditions. And then for men, free and total testosterone. We might as well do both. We might as well do dihydrotestosterone and DHEA while we're at it. Um, 
these are all good markers for vitality, uh, potential for muscle development and maintaining your muscle mass, which is really critical into your, uh, you know, senior years. So that was a, a very fast overview of my list. Feel free to comment. Feel free to add. Feel free to add other markers, biomarkers that you think are important because there's so many. And um, maybe I'll do another podcast about those ones. Maybe. <laughs>